Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Mitchell Culver, and we're going to get started here. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the life cycle of sustainable analytics, uh, moving from data collection to change management. This is a webinar that's sponsored by EDUCAUSE, by the Student Success Analytics Community Group. And some of the goals that we want to reach today are talking about change management, talking about data therapy, the need for data therapy as we deploy analytics in higher education, and also advocacy and innovation as the tail end of the analytics life cycle. Uh, a little introduction about myself. Uh, I've uh, been in the world of higher education for 10 years now. And I uh, just recently completed my PhD in curriculum and instruction at Utah State University. For the last two years, I've served as, served as a senior data analyst uh, in, the, in the division of academic and instructional services at Utah State University. And that, that division is a service entity or service unit to the larger institution. We serve faculty, staff, and administrators as we help them to do the work that is that they want to do. And so in the role that I've served the last two years, we've rolled out analytics. We partnered with a vendor, Civitas Learning, to uh, deploy analytics here at Utah State University. And this webinar is a culmination of some of the things that we learned during that process, some of the, the, the challenges that we faced and, and how we decided to overcome them. So hopefully it, it will be a, a good webinar for you. The chat feature is open, and you're able to share questions throughout the presentation. Uh, as they come to your mind. For the most part, we'll hold the questions until the end, um, but you can certainly put them into the chat box as they occur to you. And we have some people here that will, will be monitoring those questions and making sure that, that the questions that we, we think are, are most uh, uh, broadly relevant will be, will be addressed either in the presentation or near the end. The, the webinar will run for about uh, 40 minutes and then we'll have about 10 or 15 minutes left for questions before the end of the hour. So I, I really want to welcome you uh, and I also want to thank the uh, Student Success Analytics Community Group Steering Committee that's chaired by Kimberly Arnold for setting up this opportunity to have this webinar about this important topic. Now, uh, One thing to note is that the community group is having some events at the upcoming EDUCAUSE annual conference which is at the end of this month. If you're interested in joining the Student Success Analytics Community Group, you can follow this tiny URL um, that ends in SSACG for Student Success Analytics Community Group. And uh, that will give you an opportunity to join our listserv and then hear about all the updates that we provide throughout the year. Um, you can also come to the face-to-face -face events that will happen at the EDUCAUSE Annual Conference um, at the end of this month. And to, to get more information about those, you can follow this tiny URL, SSA pub, um, because there will be a pub involved. So that'll be great. So uh, the, the steering committee is organizing that. And if you have further questions, you can always reach out to Kimberly Arnold in the University of Wisconsin system. And, and she's the chair of this community group. And she can answer more explicit questions that you may have about that. All right, let's get started in today's webinar. Uh, I want to talk about some common analytics stories in higher education, things that we're used to hearing. As Utah State entered the analytics world, we waded into the waters pretty carefully and wanted to be sure that we interacted with other schools and asked them, you know, how is it going for you? How have analytics helped? What are the challenges that you faced? And there was kind of four common stories that we heard uh, re repeatedly and that we've continued to hear and that we've, we've tried to learn from. So the first is, is that there's a lot of institutions that have administrators that are really set on analytics and want to deploy them at all costs, this kind of analytics or else attitude. And so there's these a huge unresourced mandates that get issued, software is purchased unilaterally, and then everyone is expected to kind of uh, deploy that. Then the next uh, form of administrator that we see is one that gets involved in analytics because they're afraid of missing out. This fear of missing out uh, causes people to jump on the analytics bandwagon, uh, sometimes before they've got done enough research to figure out what analytics is and does and how to deploy it successfully. And so that can be somewhat concerning. The, the other ad administrator that we see, kind of a technological infrastructure administrator, is this, this idea that we can home grow analytics. We don't need to involve vendors. And in fact, vendors are the enemy. We didn't take that stance. Uh, we, we have a, a really nice partnership with Civitas Learning as a, one vendor, and, and they're building relationships with other vendors as well. 
Um, although we home grow a few things, we don't believe or, or, or have the confidence that we could home grow everything. In fact, some of the tools that are out there and available on the market are surprisingly good, stunningly good, and we want to make the, the most of those as well. The other administrators that we've met with have kind of been at, at the tail end of an analytics cycle where they don't really have anything to show for it. Analytics can be quite expensive, and two or three years into it, if, if you're not deploying the analytics effectively or with the right uh, mindset, then you may end up not having results to demonstrate their effectiveness, which can be a problem in and of itself. Now, what we kind of, the, the, the take that we kind of wanted to have on, on the analytics is that analytics are great. And, and that if you do them correctly, you can really get really stunning results. But uh, we're going to talk about how, what it, it means to deploy analytics effectively and how uh, change management is a necessary characteristic of that. Now, early in our work, we were uh, blessed to discover this paper by Dr. Kimberly Arnold, our colleague at University of Wisconsin, and, and writing with colleagues. Uh, this is called Building Institutional Capacities and Companies for System Systematic Learning Analytics Initiatives. And, um, we, uh, oh, I don't know, this is jumping around, hold on a second. We uh, basically, it looks like there's a question, has this started yet? Are, is everyone able to hear me talking? I hope so. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. All right, so this paper I was really excellent, and it, it kind of became our analytics bible. And so if you haven't looked into it, we really encourage you to, to pull this paper down. It was a panel that was given, I think, at, at LAC or, or some conference, maybe EDUCAUSE even. And basically, in this paper, it says this really great line. The promise of educational technology to underpin and drive transformative learning experiences will not be delivered through a simple adoption process. Overnight success in silver bullet solutions in the realm of learning analytics is highly unlikely. Generally, it is vital to deliver a message of persistence and dedication that, in time, will hopefully yield meaningful results. Well, what do they mean by persistence and dedication? And, and that's the question that we had. We, we had this idea of, well, w if we're going to be persistent at this and dedicated to making sure that analytics uh, are delivered successfully, what can we do to make that happen? And from my experience, uh, I, I thought about tools and people, that analytics are a tool that can exist in the hands of a professional. And if I was a betting person, who would I bet on? Would I bet on tools or would I bet on professionals? And the answer is, I would bet on both. Uh, the, uh, a well-crafted tool in the hand of a well-trained professional is perhaps the best bet on analytics that you can make. That the combination of tools and people is essential to effective, basically effective uh, delivery of analytic systems. So, so how do we do this? What's, what's the approach that we want to take? Well, if you're going to bet on people, you need to think about what people need, what people are, and what helps them to thrive and survive in life. And there's some really great research, 40 plus years of research about human motivations that basically tell us that human beings have three basic psychological needs. And this is the work of DC and Ryan and, and many other authors that have written about this topic. So humans need to have a feeling of autonomy, they need to have a feeling of competence, and they need to have a feeling of relatedness in order to s survive and thrive. Uh, the research basically talks about our need to explore our environment and make good choices in that environment. And that as we make choices and learn from those choices, we're able to share those successes and failures with those around us. And so it's, it's an important thing to understand that if you're trying to change a university, you first have to worry about changing the people of the university. And that means, fundamentally, focusing on what human beings need. And these three things have, have over 40 years, been clearly demonstrated to, to yield really stellar results, especially in the workplace. So as we talk about these three needs, as they manifest in the workplace, we have basically three different ways of looking at them. So professional agency is our need for autonomy. It's this idea that we want to make choices at work and be, be trusted in the choices that we make to move around and to do the things that we've been assigned to do in our role. We want to have competence, and that manifests itself as professional mastery, which is basically knowing when you've done a good job, and also knowing when you haven't done a good job. It's very hard to get better at things when you haven't successfully uh, uh, looked at your failures and, and been honest with yourself about how to overcome those failures in the future and to, to get a better result the next time. The third 
human need, relatedness manifests itself professionally as professional accountability, which is being able to tell your story of successes and failures. When, when things have gone well, people love to share that out with others, not only colleagues, but administrators and stakeholders. When things haven't gone as well, it's important also to share that out, especially with administrators and stakeholders, so that they know where things are at and how we're planning to improve. Now, important um, assessment tool that we've relied on in our kind of administrative management of, of employees is this PLUS Delta model, which is basically saying PLUS is things that are going well, what's going well, and Delta is the Greek symbol for change, and it represents what could be better. And in, in, in this model, we find a, a, an implied sense that failure is going to happen, right? That we can't just have PLUS minus, because minus implies that, well, one, once we know that something's bad, there's nothing you can do. Delta implies, well, once we have identified something that maybe perhaps isn't working correctly, uh, we, can, we can work to make it better. We can work to innovate. So that's an important a tool that we use to, to think about this idea of what analytics are. So if you look at a formal definition of analytics, it will tell you that analytics is data-informed decision-making that leads to action. And we, we agree with that de uh, definition wholeheartedly, but we kind of want a more informal definition that helps us think about how analytics interact with the human element. So we want to redefine analytics as informally a way to follow up on the choices you've made and answer the questions, what's going well and what could be better? And when you think about analytics in that way, it makes them a lot more approachable. It, we're not doing assessment for assessment's sake. We're not doing evaluation just so that we could put a microscope on the university or on our staff or on students. Instead, we're doing analytics so that we can get back to these basic human needs and actually get better at the work that we're doing at, in higher education. So in that third circle of professional of accountability, we want to be sure to, to note that it's important to tell both successes and failures. And as often as we're, we're telling a story about a failure, what we're really talking about is ways that, that that situation can improve and get better. And so those two columns could be renamed advocacy and innovation. We advocate as often as analytics or evaluation shows that we have done a, a good job. And we innovate as often as the, the analytics tools show that we could be doing better. And so advocacy and innovation really close this loop on the basic human needs where we've made choices, we've tried to determine whether or not we've done a good job, and then we work with other people through relationships to tell our story of successes and failures in a way that helps us to be focused on innovation and high quality programs and curriculum. So that brings us to the life cycle of sustainable analytics, which is what we're trying to talk about today. Uh, you'll see that this kind of has six different stages, but the, the, the important thing to remember is that that final stage is advocacy and innovation, like we've been talking about. Analytics provide real-time answers to the questions, what is going well and what could be better? And in doing so, they help fulfill basic human needs. We have this basic human need to, to not only improve ourselves so that we have a sense of competence, but to share that improvement with those around us. And, and this is an important thing to understand. So as we look at this cycle, like what's going on in these six stages? Well, the first three are really important, really critical. We would think of these as kind of formal analytics. So we have the first is data collection and access. And there's a lot of things that go into that. There's things like data governance and policy. There's things like uh, interoperability of tools. Lots of different things that have to do with data collection and access. And so that one cell, that first stage, can be expanded to, to include many different topics. The next cell is data science and modeling, which is the statistics and forms of analysis and methods that we use to make the, the data uh, turn into insights, right? How do we get the data to become insights that are actual, actionable and mean, meaningful? And then third, visualization and workflow. It's very hard to do analytics without visualizing data and also without creating workflows that make sense for the professionals that use them. So that's formal analytics. It's an important step. And we can't say enough about how important it is to get good analytic systems in place. Whether you home grow them or rely on vendors to provide those tools, these first three stages are critical. And I would say that they're necessary for success in a sustainable analytics initiative, but, but they're not sufficient in and of themselves. And that leads to the second half of this, this cycle, which is basically re reframed as the fulfillment of human needs. So we have socialization of tools, which is helping people to understand the tools and, and how they're going to help them to be a, a better professional. We have empowerment of human action, 
which means taking data actually into a space where it can actually help people to innovate the university or innovate the program services and curriculum we provide. And then of course that final important step of advocacy and innovation. And again, both of these are necessary and sufficient uh, together that, that, that will make analytics sustainable. If you have one or the other, um, both, but while both are necessary, neither by itself will be sufficient to help make analytics sustainable. We see a lot of institutions dumping a lot of resources into the first three boxes, formal analytics, hoping that tools will somehow magically pay off and do the work and, and make a silver bullet situation where suddenly an institution's a different institution. But we don't see enough schools focusing on the second half of this life cycle, which is basically focusing on developing professionals. Uh, an important thing to understand is, is that if you want the institution to get better results, you have to help your professionals change their practice. And that's what this life cycle is all about. Now, there's need for data therapy. Because these two halves of the life cycle are kind of in different spaces, one in the space of technological infrastructure and the other in the space of human resources management, um, you need people that can bridge the, the worlds, right? We call these data therapists. This is a little bit moji of me, uh, and it says, don't let the data drive. And I think that that's important. I hear this throughout the higher education. It's being said a lot. Don't let, uh, uh, data driven, data driven. Everything's supposed to be data driven. And the thing is, is if it's data driven, then the data is driving. And what we want to do is, is, is let professionals drive and give them the tools that they need to drive successfully. And so we, we need data therapists to bridge this gap, to, to help the, the professionals that we are expecting to use the analytics actually get success from those tools and not putting so much resources into the tools that we forget to invest in the people. And that's what data therapy is all about. Now, people will say, well, how do you do data therapy? What do you do? You go around and you ask people, how did that data make you feel? Right, here's a little cartoon. It says, I really like the user interface, but I still have questions about the data freshness, right? No, it's not data therapy in that respect. Data therapy basically is just a reminder to yourself that you're dealing with human beings and that if your institution is going to get better results than it got before, it will be human beings that actually achieve those results. Now, will they have tools in their hands? Yes. Analytics is an important part of this conversation. But when you're trying to socialize analytics, you have to remember that people will pick up a new skill, a new ability, if the person who's trying to ask them to do that is, is attentive to those human needs. And that's what data therapy is all about. So in autonomy, you give people choices. You don't mandate that they use analytics. You don't mandate how they use analytics. You give them a lot of choices and, and freedom in that. It doesn't mean you, you allow them to be negligent, but you do, to the extent that it's possible, you give people choices. Uh, you focus on their competence. You help them to do good work. For the most part, people love doing great work. And if you can help them to do great work and help them to see how analytics fit into the work that they already love doing, then you have, you have, you're doing data therapy. You're helping people to heal from their seventh grade math class, for example, and get used to the idea that data is part of life and is actually something that we should be, have positive feelings about, not negative feelings about. And then finally, to do data therapy, you focus on relatedness. You help professionals share their story of success and, and also of failure, but in a way that is focused on growth and innovation. And so this is what data therapy, the heart of data therapy, is all about fulfilling these basic human needs. Now, it would be helpful if we had some examples. I think it's important to understand that um, we, we have had two years of experience uh, uh, experimenting with these different strategies. And I want to share these examples uh, as practical examples that will help you to think about how you might focus on the second half of that analytics life cycle. So the first is a program evaluation example. We have analytics that help us to, to conduct program evaluation rapidly. And during the past year, we've, we've used those new analytics tools to conduct hundreds of what we call boutique program assessments, just little ones, not huge, massive assessments that take six months or eight, eight months or three years or whatever it is, but boutique assessments that provide critical insights to dozens of units at the right time. And the tool that, that makes that possible is a tool that um, was deployed by Civitas Learning for us. And it is something that we handed off to them, so to speak, in terms of uh, making sure that the proper data was collected 
making sure that the proper modeling was occurring behind the scenes and making sure that we would we were returned really high quality visualizations and workflows. Now as part of that, we have to work as consultants, data consultants, evaluation consultants, with, with uh, our partners here, our stakeholders here at the institution to help them to collect data more effectively and to give us access to that data in a way that, that helps us to use this tool. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that process and how rather than just deploying the tool, which would have been interesting and good, we really have focused on not just this first half of the analytics cycle, but also on the second half uh, by fulfilling human needs. So uh, this is the same slide as before, but this is common assessment stories in higher education. So uh, they're the same old, same old assessment stories that you've always heard, partly because when people are feeling stressed by something like assessment, these emotions come out, don't they? So there, there are administrators who will go around and say assessment or else. Um, there's people that are in charge of, of programs who will say, oh, I'm afraid of math. I don't know how to do assessment and evaluation. Um, there's people who say, oh, you want to assess or evaluate our program? You must think that we're not doing a good job. And then there's obviously people who get really bummed out by assessment and, and don't like it all. Rather than, than appealing to these emotions, we felt like we could be a lot more positive about assessment and say, oh, you know what, actually assessment's great. And as long as we're approaching it with, the, the eye, with an eye towards fulfilling basic human needs, we actually can do it in a way that is very professionally empowering. So the product that, that we, allows us to do this is called Illum Impact, and it does a prediction-based propensity score match. Now, this is the five steps that, that help us to understand what is happening with a, with a prediction-based propensity score match in Illum Impact. But Understanding the actual nuts and bolts of it isn't, isn't necessarily essential to what we're doing here. Rather than, than walking you through all these five stages, what I'm going to say is, is, is that one of the reasons why you need data therapists is because you need people on, on campus who have expertise to, to a degree that they can shepherd others through very complex statistical processes. And so that's what this, this slide is, is, is this very complex process that it's actually pretty easy to understand, but we never want administrators to have to work in isolation trying to understand these. So when we complete the, the when we upload the, the files to the software and we, we get the results that are returned to us, we create a nine to 12 page report that is actually gonna structure an experience for the program administrators that we're partnering with. So right now what we're doing is basically we're saying, okay, we want to provide you with a report, but we don't want to provide you with a report in a vacuum. We're not going to email you the report. We're not going to just hand it off and be done. Instead, we want to build you out as a human being. We want to build you out as a program administrator to more effectively understand how this assessment opportunity can help you improve your practice as you oversee your program. So we have three stages. The first stage is helping program administrators to understand their data and the context of their programs so that they can actually collect the right data so that they can hand it off to us and, and, and this is an ongoing process. A lot of units that we work with don't necessarily start with the cleanest data set. They don't necessarily start with the most uh, data collection acumen. And so this first stage is really critical to helping professionals to understand that the data is in, in, in an important aspect of their job, that, that tracking how their decisions are paying off is an important aspect of their job. We often use logic models to facilitate this process. For those of you that aren't familiar with the Kellogg logic model, uh, it's a five-stage model of program design that helps people think through what their program is, what it does, and what their program is supposed to be accomplishing. So in that initial consultation and data handoff, we often get clean, ready data sets. We often get situations where the data is not yet clean, but it's an excellent opportunity to develop people in their professionalism and to, to help them to thrive in, in that data collection process. The next stage is this delivery of the executive summary. So we go away and we do work for three or four days. Sometimes it takes maybe two weeks. And we use that program Illum Impact 
to come back with results that are meaningful, but that we don't want these administrators to interpret in a vacuum. So we show up and we have a 1.5 hour visit to make sure that they understand everything in the report and also so that we can document some of their thoughts about why the results are what they are. Remember, humans have this basic need to see the work that they've done and to determine whether or not the choices that they've made have paid off. And this is an opportunity, people love this opportunity because we come to the table prepared to talk about their successes and also prepared to talk about ways that they can improve their practice. And those reports help us to do that. And then finally, we do follow-up visits and planning for the future so that rather than saying we're it's a one-and-done service, we actually plan a cyclical process where uh, they make plans for innovation, they make plans for advocating for things that have gone well, and then we kind of speak with them and say, oh great, this is excellent. We'd like to come back in four to six months to document some of the things that you've done to improve your practice. And that's actually really helpful for accreditation. A lot of accrediting bodies don't actually care that assessment has occurred or that assessment has gone well and shows that the programs are effective. Instead, accreditors often care more that once assessment has occurred, that further action is being taken to improve practice. And, and that's essential to that accreditation process. So what do some of these results look like? Well, here's some of the results that we see from that propensity score matching that we, we do in Civitas Learning's Illum Impact. The, the programs listed here are six different programs where we were provided with participant data and also given an understanding of how participants might match up with other students that, are, that were similar to them, which is what this pr prediction-based propensity score match does. After you do, you do the matching, the, the, it's an automated system, you get back a lift, which is these percentages, of the percent of students that are seen to, to persist when they otherwise would not have expected to be based on the matching that we do. And you can use a basic tuition dollars multiplier to figure out how in uh, an annual period how much retained tuition these programs are being associated with. So, Basically, you can see here the supplemental instruction was a 2.83% lift. That was a uh, 11,000 matched students, and that means that that program uh, over the last four years has retained an estimated half a million dollars in, in tuition revenue. Uh, first year experience course, uh, we were able to match 860 students and saw a 2.79% lift, and when you multiply 2.79, out by 860 and the tuition multiplier you get $182,000 and so on and so forth and so you can see that this program is actually really valuable in producing meaningful results but I'm not here to focus necessarily on the the outcomes of our analytics and more to focus on the idea that these interactions with professionals are helping them to understand that there are really rapid ways to follow up on their programs and the programmatic choices that they've made to determine whether or not the things are headed in the right direction. And so this example helps us to, to see that, in fact, uh, it is this kind of balancing act, constant balancing act, of looking at the formal analytics and their relative value, and also attempting to fulfill human needs and help professionals grow, rather than focusing just on the, the fact that the tools do amazing things. Now, the next example is one of faculty development. Um, we have another analytics tool that uses predictive analytics to tie to uh, student activity in the classroom. And as part of that, we have provided faculty with new insights on how to improve their teaching and scaffold student success. Now, because this webinar is only 50 minutes, I don't want to go into this example, but I do want to say that I've written about it in a white paper. And this is a teaser for the white paper that is actually a companion to this webinar, which we'll be sending out with the recording later this week. And in this, white paper, you'll be able to see what, what is it that they did with faculty. How did they use autonomy, competence, and relatedness as a frame, as a backdrop uh, against which to provide faculty with really powerful training. Uh, the, the teaser is, is, is that the result of the training, multiple times we've had faculty approach us and say, you know, this is the best training that we've received in 20 years. And we, we, we know that's meaningful, and we know it's meaningful because what kicks the training off is data. And to start with, start a two-hour training with some analytics and some data, and to do really heavy pedagogy work with faculty and end with a faculty member saying, wow, this was the best training I've had in 20 years, 
It's really a powerful effect. And so I want to kind of alert you to that coming um, report, and, and you can read more about our work with faculty in that report. The next example I want to give is about academic advisors. Um, we have a staff of 70-something uh, professional advisors here at Utah State University. And we know that when we identify and reach out to our most at-risk students, they get better results. So advising analytics actually help us to identify those students that we need to re reach out to. And this, this story of how we socialized advising analytics amongst our ad academic advising staff is fairly compelling. So we started in August of 2017 with the software being released to us and doing basic software training for the academic advisors. Uh, it was very much a click here, click there kind of training. Although we had some handouts that were meant to inspire them to action, we kind of got a sense that um, the, the advisors weren't really catching the spirit, spirit of analytics. There was a lot of data trust issues. There was a lot of questions about how they were going to incorporate this new tool into their existing very full workflows. Um, that if they were already feeling overburdened and overstressed with the students they were already visiting it, how, how is it that we were expecting them to reach out to even more students? Now, that wasn't the entire advising community, but it was a sizable uh, minority and it was, it was something that we wanted to, to monitor. As the semester unfolded, you can see that the activity in the program, both in number of logins and number of users month by month, wasn't really that great. And by the end of the semester, we knew that we had done, done it kind of just okay job of deploying this, this product. So the, the idea was is that, well, let's just remind ourselves what we're about here. In our life cycle of sustainable analytics, it's not the tools that make the difference. It's people when they feel empowered in those basic human needs. So how can we empower these advisors in their basic human needs of autonomy, competence, and relatedness? In other words, how can we put them through some data therapy? So we went back to the drawing board, and we, we looked at uh, the creation of a best practices timeline. This was co-created with a team of academic advisors who had been champion users of the analytics. There were a pocket of advisors who were very excited when the analytics were rolled out and got to work using them. And we were able to see that activity and know that these advisors might have some ideas on how to make this successful for their, peer, for their peers. So they came up with this best practices timeline, which you'll notice it's a very autonomy supporting timeline because there's, there's moments on the timeline that say, look, you probably shouldn't be doing analytics in this time period. Week one through three, it says too busy for analytics. You might do a, a graduation nudge or something like that. But for the most part, you're busy enough as it is. You're a professional and you can exercise your judgment and, and, and week one through three is maybe a time to avoid using analytics. Week four through eight, however, is a sweet spot for analytics. We really want you to get in there. Our risk predictions stabilize and, and we want to see some proactive student outreach and, and this is a really healthy period to reach out to, to, to students who are at risk and who might benefit from your, your interaction. And then tapering off, you can see that actually week 9 through 14, again, it says too busy for analytics because we're worried about registration. And then you might do a little bit of end of turn triage. But for the most part, that week 4 through 8 is where we want to see analytics happening. And then there's these seven or eight choices that you have of all these different activities you can do throughout the semester. So as part of that, we also released a new training, a training that empowered that professionalism through focusing on advisors, autonomy, competence, and relatedness. So we talked to them about the ethics of big data so that they can understand that we weren't just rolling out these analytics products to, so to speak, spy on students, that we were actually rolling them out so that these well-trained, highly professional advisors could do the work that they needed to do to get the students into their offices so that they could make a big difference. Um, we used some really good examples of nursing and lifeguarding examples where, in, in, for example, in Harborview Medical in Seattle, there's a really great analytic system that predicts when, student, uh, when hospital patients have sepsis. And the nurses use that system to kind of notify themselves when, when they need to just pay more attention. But a lot of times the system's wrong and they can just shut it off because they're the professional and their judgment matters. This example is really helpful for the advisors to realize that they're actually driving the system. The system isn't driving them. And then the lifeguarding example was one about this idea that when you reach out to students who feel like they're drowning, you're actually helping save their academic lives. 
And advisors felt like this was a, a new lens through which to view analytics that was positive and that helped to remind them that they were agents of the institution that have excellent judgment and that are going to make good judgments um, and that the analytics are really just a tool. And that best practices timeline is just a tool for them to have some options of things to choose from. Well, how did this affect advisor activity in the product? We saw this massive uptick in advisor use of the product immediately after we released this best practices timeline with the autonomy supportive of training attached. We went from an average of you know, 45, 50 users all the way up into the 70s. And then you can see it tapers off towards the end of the semester. And of course, that's because that's how we train them. We said, you know, there's this sweet spot in February where it's going to make a lot of sense to do analytics outreach. But as the semester winds on, your activity in the product can wane because the, the activities that you're doing more towards the end of the semester may not make as much sense. And throughout, we just kept reminding them that it, it was up to them. They had the choice to use the product or not. Um, some advisors took that to mean that they didn't have to use the product. And I'm going to show you here in a second that we always want to follow up with, with people about the choices that they made. So we very much made the, this idea of analytics are a tool. They're a tool that you use when it makes sense to use it. And we had a lot of pockets of advisors that said, well, it doesn't make sense to use it, and I'm not going to use it at all. And and remember, analytics help us to follow up on the choices that we've made. So our next stage was actually to look at how advisor activity in analytic systems actually could be associated or might be associated with student persistence. So what we're looking at here is the results of our persistence gains over the last three or four years. Um, when we're looking at 2015 and it says a 0.13, that's a 0.13 gain in spring to fall persistence over the previous year. 2014. 2016, we saw a half a percent gain over the 2015 year in our persistence rates from spring to fall. You want to count it in students, it was 72 students. If you want to count it in dollars, it's uh, a third of a million dollar. We don't really like to count things in dollars, but it helps to drive the point home when people see it in dollars. What we really like to count things in is the number of families that are that one semester closer to having a college graduate in their family. In 2017, you can see this tenth of a point increase, or a 0.09% increase in persistence compared to the previous year, or 15 student gain. And then in 2018, following that spring use of, of that analytic software, you can see this 2.34% gain, which is huge. Everything that we saw before was less than half a percent. And in 2018, this semester, we saw a 2.34% gain, which is 369 students. That's 10 times higher than what we've seen ever. And it's a $1.5 million gain in tuition for just this semester. So that's a pretty impressive result. My question in looking at this as an analyst was, but yeah, but, but what explains it? What helps explain this jump? And you know, we went around and we asked all the different administrators, you know, what has changed this year at Utah State University? What has made students more than ever before come back after the summer break? And a lot of people said, well, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe it's that Civitas thing. And when we poked around, we saw academic advisor activity being uh, a, a lead as an explainer for some of these results. So what we did was we took average number of logins per advisor by each advising unit, right? We have 12 advising units. So there's eight colleges at Utah State University, and each one has an advising unit. There's the exploratory advising unit. And then we have regional campuses and some other campuses throughout the state that are part of our system that were also trained on how to use this Civitas advisor product. So you can see the average logins by advising unit per advisor in spring 2018. And then you can see the, the increase by advising unit in persistence in the spring to fall 2018 kind of increase over the previous year. And you start to see an immediate pattern. Now patterns are funny because they can be misleading. I want to point out a few things. So the highest gain in increase in persistence was 7.77, was associated with the highest number of average logins to Civitas. The second highest gain in persistence at the advising unit level was seen with the second highest level of advisors logging into Civitas. The worst gain in persistence over the previous year was actually a 2% drop, and that was associated with the least amount of advisor logins to Civitas. Now, as you look at this, there's some anomalies. Like this first line, 
uh, it says a 0.87 increase in persistence, but they have these actually the third highest average log in Civitas. And that's because these averages are actually skewed. In that particular college advising unit, those logins were achieved almost exclusively by two or three advisors out of 12 or 15. And what that means is that, that the, the data is skewed, and so we don't necessarily want to rely on the skewed data, so we want to use a median, right? We don't want to use the mean, we want to use a median. So I'm going to go to the next slide, which is instead of being the mean logins, it's actually the median logins. And across that top row, you can see that number 23 jumped down to a 7. And now we get a much better picture. We still have those same patterns of number 1, number 2, and last. But you start to get a much better picture, and when you correlate these two columns of numbers, you get an R-squared value of a 0.56, and it's significant. And what that means is that the use of advisor analytics was associated with a 207 student gain over previous years. And it's a remarkable thing to see this laid out so clearly um, and, and to know that, in fact, these things are paying off. So remember, if you remember the model of data therapy, we want to help people to make good choices at work, to know when they've done a good job or not, and then help them tell their stories of success and failure. In this case, we, we meet with the advising units and talk to them about, you know, you made the decision not to use analytics for the most part, that's okay, or to use it less frequently than what we had recommended. And now, we get to see the, the outcomes of those choices. And this is an important thing. It's not to beat people over the head with the data, but it's to say, we actually can follow up on those, those gut decisions that we make and say, you know, I don't think these analytics are going to pay off, so I'm not going to use them. And then you can see, well, actually, that decision is associated with less of a gain than, than other units who were pretty eager to, to adopt these, these analytics were able to achieve through kind of mature use of analytics. And so that's an important thing to remember, that part of helping people develop that competence, that mastery, is helping them through their successes and failures so that they can properly advocate and innovate. So that's kind of the whole life cycle of sustainable analytics. We do have formal analytics. They're important. They are necessary. But they're not sufficient for driving institutional change. We also need to have an eye towards fulfilling those human needs as we develop out professionalism, greater 21st century professionalism, and, and greater data literacy amongst our professionals as they use those analytics. The toolkit that I want to leave you with before we jump to questions are, first, institutions do not change and grow unless their professionals change and grow. You can buy all the tools that you want and spend all the money on new initiatives that you want and et cetera and so forth, but at the core, if the professionals are not changing their everyday practice, then the institutional results will not change. The second item in the toolkit that I want to leave you with is that analytics are only sufficient when coupled tightly with the skills and intelligence of competent human users. Too often, I think, that we see in the headlines analytics being heralded as the silver bullet or as the thing that will save institutions from 21st century changes. But analytics are only sufficient when we have competent human users that are wielding them to make really great decisions on behalf of the institution and then to follow up on those decisions through the, the available data. And three, the third item of the toolkit is that data therapy means giving people choices, helping them to do good work, and helping them to share their stories. Whether the stories turn out well or not, it's helping them really come in contact with what it is that, they, they, that they've done and accomplished as they've made choices. The, there's a question about, is the white paper on faculty development available online? I should make it clear that the white paper is actually about all of this content. Um, not just the faculty development. The faculty development is like one or two pages of a 30-page white paper. And so it will be available in our digital commons, but it won't be available until we send out the recording for this webinar. And, and part of that is because it's still being formatted. So, so we'll, get, we'll get the recording out to everyone, and we'll also get uh, the white paper out to everyone. That's uh, everything that I have to say. So I want to open it up before we, we kind of run out of time here for any questions that people have. And if you just type those into to, um, the chat box, that, that, then we can respond to them. So it looks like the first question we have is, are we going to describe in more detail the vendor products you have used? We're, at this time, we're not. I can say that Civitas Learning is, is more than happy and, and willing to, to share with you their products. Educause webinars are, are not necessarily a space to, to highlight um, opportunities to spend money at different vendors, right? Really, we wanted to focus on the practice of 
sharing analytics at an institution and deploying them widely and effectively. Um, and then as far as vendor conversations go, just know that vendors are a good way to go, but they're not the only way to go, and they're not even necessarily uh, the, the most common, common way to go. A lot, of, a lot of institutions are very successful by homegrown analytics and deploying analytic tools that they've developed themselves. What type of data governance policies and infrastructure do we have to ensure students are informed about their data being used and provide consent within the life cycle of sustainable analytics? This is a great question. With uh, GDPR in, in mind over in the EU, it's important to understand that in the United States, there's a very different um, data governance practice that exists. In the United States, when a student signs up to interact with an institution, they're signing up to have a data exchange with that institution. They don't have to sign their data away. There's an understanding that the, through FERPA, the institution is going to protect the student's data and use it for legitimate educational interests of the student. And so underneath that federal policy, institutions are safe to do uh, business intelligence analytics that help them to run the university more effectively and, and remain within that policy. Now, we have internal data governance policies where we have internal data sharing agreements that as we link systems up and connect systems internally, we, we have policy that's really robust that allows us to do that and allows oversight of data trustees to make sure that they're signing away the, the access to that data in times and in places that make sense. Uh, part of the focus of, uh, on data governance and policies is, is the focus on making sure that everything that you're doing is transparent uh, to all of your stakeholders, including students. And that transparency tends to be one of the most important first steps for getting good data governance and policy in place. So that everything that you're doing, you're doing with um, the proper compliance officers involved, the proper uh, FERPA specialist involved, if IRB is being involved for faculty research, uh, nothing we presented here was IRB or faculty kind of related research. This was all business intelligence research that, that helped us just to make the university more effective. Um, does context make any difference in the use of analytics? I mean, can we say that different contexts require different analytics? Absolutely. And this is why it's important to focus on the professional. If you're going to put a tool into someone's hands, that tool needs to make contextual sense for those professionals' needs. A lot of times we see institutions purchasing analytics and deploying them uh, with, uh, with almost one disregard for whether or not the professionals actually uh, fit nicely with the tools that are being given to them. We want tools to match roles. We want tools to match professional skills and interests. And so context is almost everything as, as far as that's concerned. Uh, next question is, what types of practice did you use to increase data literacy on campus to help campus partners feel more comfortable navigating using data? That again is that data therapy. So a lot of that has to do with sitting people, uh, sitting with people, talking with them about their questions, talking with them about their concerns and fears and helping them to feel that there is always someone there to help shepherd them. We talk about what we call data drunkenness and a designating a, a designated data, data driver where an administrator may feel overwhelmed by the data to the point that they're not able to function with it. But that doesn't mean that they can't still be in the driver's, not the driver's seat, but, but in the vehicle with someone else to come and designatedly drive the data so that, so that they can understand, oh, okay, I see what's happening here. And sometimes that process takes quite a while before you, you get to a point where a person is really feeling comfortable with the data. But in all cases, it's, it's always focusing about where is the person at, what do they need, and how can I help them to take the next step. The next question is, from your experiences, what is the main challenge in the use of analytics at the university? I would say that the main challenge is focusing on tools, not professionalism. The next question is, what made this huge difference in retention and persistence for 2018 compared to your previous years? The answer is at least 56% of it was associated with advisor activity in that risk model. The remaining 44% is a lot of different things that, that uh, were going on at the institution. The nice thing about applied research is that you don't always have to know the exact answer. We're not doing uh, peer-reviewed research in order to help make institutional decisions. We're doing applied research, and what that means is, is that you're able to look at a situation and use, you know, hold your finger to the wind, and use the analytics to your best of your ability to make a competent decision and, and to have a really good guess as to how do these changes happen and, and what do we think is, is the most likely cause and is there data to support those kind of thoughts about 
about how the, how the practice, the professional practice, has led to such good results. We have some other ideas about the remainder of that increase in persistence, but it would take an entire webinar just to explore all of those different features of, of those recent gains. The next question is, have you used student-facing analytics tools? And if so, have you noticed any interesting consequences? We are just starting to tow the waters of deploying student-facing analytics tools, and we're very excited about it. But remember, with professionals, it's very easy to step in and, and facilitate a professional's deeper understanding of an analytics tool, especially as they have questions. They can call you up. With student-facing analytics tools, um, you have to have a lot uh, simpler user interface and a, a lot less sophistication just to make sure that the students don't get confused by what they're looking at and, and develop wild, unfounded assumptions about, about themselves or about whatever is occurring. And so a lot of times you want to deploy student-facing tools um, in the hands of professionals. So you might de deploy them through academic advisors where advisors and students sit together and work on those analytics insights together. Uh, but we're just starting to tow that water and we're very excited about that prospect. I think we're going to just take one last question here, and it says, have you con considered pedagogical practice in your program for assessment? So yes and no. S the scholarship of teaching and learning is very important to the analytics that we're trying to pursue. But it's important to understand that uh, pedagogical practice is in a domain uh, that is completely controlled by the faculty. And to involve ourselves in that practice, even to offer that two-hour training that we offered, um, it took a lot of partnering and a lot of political capital to get those trainings on, on, on the docket. To, to do assessment um, of pedagogy, we would also need a little bit more authority. We are part of a division that's a service entity. We don't have any lines of authority to faculty, to advisors, or to most staff. And as such, to de deploy a, a pedagogical kind of assessment, that would be the authority of the provost office, not our authority in our division. Thanks for the excellent questions, and thank you for your patience as we got started and worked out the technical, technical difficulties. Uh, here, I just want to remind you that um, you can join the Student Success Analytics Community Group. It's a community group that has a listserv where we send out updates on, on a regular basis. We have these quarterly webinars. Um, and so if you're interested in joining that community group, whether or not you're part of Educause or whether or not you, you're attending the annual conference, you can, you can join us by, by going to this tiny URL that ends in SSACG, which is Student Success Analytics Community Group. And then if you'll be at the Educause Annual Conference, please join us for the face-to-face -face meeting on Wednesday, October 31st from uh, 1.30 to 2.15 in room 405. And then there's an informal networking at Pines Pub on Thursday, November 1st at 6 p.m. I won't be attending Educause this year, but there's some great folks from the steering committee that will be there. And we, we hope to have a good crowd to, to talk more about the importance of analytics in the 21st century. And the tiny URL for that, for that informal networking is Student Success Analytics Pub. SSA Pub is the tiny URL. Uh, if you have any other questions, you can always reach out to me by email. We will be sending that recording and the white paper uh, later on this week. So keep an eye on your inbox. And, and thank you so much for attending.